8 a.m. session in the Big Apple. Uh, either you're the non-partying group or the, uh, we'll say you're the more resilient group uh, among, among your colleagues here. So I'm going to talk more globally kind of what makes cannabis so intriguing and exciting for the treatment of human health, uh, some of the challenges and unknowns that we have out there, and some of the barriers to doing research in this field. So as you know, we're seeing the greening of America, right? We're now at a point where we have 11 states that have legalized recreational use, 33 that have legalized medicinal, and every time I give a lecture, I need to hop on the internet and look for the latest map to see what new state has flipped in this area. All of this really started, though, back in the 90s, um, and actually with many of the, the patients you see, because there were persistent anecdotal evidence in the 90s, or the early stages of the HIV AIDS epidemic, in which people reported that use of cannabis really helped with nausea, vomiting, wasting, etc. During the 90s, there was also the discovery of the endocannabinoid system, which really moved the science further along and enabled at least some studies to take place. And this all really mirrored the political shifts that were taking place um, during this time. So we, we have the impression like, oh my God, what is happening in the last five years? But the world is changing, all this, these states are flipping and legalizing cannabis. Well, this actually started a long time ago. So following the war on drugs, the attitudes of Americans and adults towards the use of cannabis, and particularly the use of cannabis for potential medical reasons, really began to shift, such that by around 2.10, there was finally a crossover in which the majority of Americans thought it should be legal. So this is really the end game of what's been going on for a couple decades. During that time, and a lot of this was kicked off when we think about medicinal cannabis with the Compassionate Use Act in the state of California. So in the mid-90s, the citizens passed this law that allowed patients to have access to cannabis for medicinal reasons. At that time, the legislature said, well, if we're going to pass this, we need better science, because not a lot had taken place. It had been perhaps 20 years since anyone had done any smoked cannabis studies for medicinal purposes. So they allocated funding uh, to create a, a research center, and that's how we came into being, or UCSD, the Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research. And our task was to uh, facilitate high-quality studies and look at the potential benefits and limitations of using cannabis as medicine. With the pack, passage of Prop 64, which legalized cannabis in the state of California, the CMCR has been allocated $2 million a year in funding sort of indefinitely to continue this research and to uh, conduct and facilitate studies around the state. So as, you, as you're probably aware, cannabis is not one single ingredient. There's not one type of cannabis uh, whenever we talk about it. So I'll use the term cannabis and cannabinoids sort of uh, interchangeably, but uh, uh, they are different aspects. So in cannabis, we know there are something like a hundred different cannabinoids in the plant. The two primary ones we're aware of and always talk about are THC, which is the primary psychoactive ingredient in, in the plant. And then of course, CBD is very popular right now. And it's a cannabinoid that appears to have medicinal benefits, but is non-intoxicating. Uh, we sort of shy away from the notion of psychoactive because clearly there's some studies indicating it is psychoactive in terms of anxiety reduction and so forth, but in terms of impairing or intoxicating, so far studies haven't shown that CBD causes uh, any of those effects. So those are the things we always talk about, and right now everything, including the research we do, is focused on THC and CBD, but the plant is really complex. Uh, there are things known as terpenoids, which give the plant the, the aroma that it has, and there are indications that terpenoids, not just in cannabis, but in other, other plants, uh, may modulate how cannabinoids interact with different receptors, may interact and act on serotonin. And then flavonoids are the things that give the color to the plant, and there are also some studies suggesting that it may have oxidant, uh, antioxidant properties. So there's a lot to learn about this plant, and we're really focusing on only a couple constituents right now. The plant uh, interacts with two receptors, uh, or, and as well as the endocannabinoid interacts with these receptors. So the, the, they were given the, the clever names of CB1 and CB2 for cannabinoid receptor 1, cannabinoid receptor 2. Cannabinoid receptor 1 is really prevalent throughout the brain. It's perhaps the most prevalent receptor in the brain, actually. Um, and Dr. Chang is going to talk in some detail about this. Uh, but you really see it widely distributed, and it really matches on well to the effects that you see when people get high. Uh, 
So THC binds to CB1, and you'll find a lot of these receptors in the hippocampus, so people start having learning and retention problems. In the cerebellum, they have some problems with balance and so forth, and it really maps well when you look at things such as the munchies and so forth with where these receptors are located. CB2 we know less about, but it's, it's uh, prevalent in the immune cells and is believed to reduce inflammation. So these receptors aren't there just to sort of receive uh, THC and so forth from the plant. They're actually there for a reason. That's because we have our own endocannabinoid system that has these chemicals in our body. Uh, right now, there are a few that have been identified. The most prevalent or the most commonly acknowledged are something called anandamide and 2-AG. What's really different and exciting about cannabinoids is they're different than other types of neurotransmitters in that they're sort of, they're silent, and then when they're needed, they pop up very quickly and they go away. So they don't hang around like uh, dopamine, serotonin for a little while. They're actually just very briefly available. And they've been referred to as kind of a dimmer switch. They bring homeostasis. So if things are overactive, et cetera, they pop out, they act, and then calm things down. I think Dr. Chang is going to talk about this in a little more detail and with a little more neuroscience behind it than that. So support technology, obviously cannabis goes back, I'm sure you've heard, from thousands uh, of years uh, BC. Actually, you can find it in Chinese manuscripts and so forth. And even here in the United States, it was legal up until the early 1900s. Okay, this is a product put out by Eli Lilly in 1913 called Cannabis Americana. If you look at the... Uh, If you look at the indications, you'll see that it's as good as an analgesic, so pain relief, hypnotic, antispasmodic, and a powerful narcotic. For a variety of reasons, political, etc., it disappeared, right? All of these ended up becoming illegal and unavailable for various taxation reasons and so forth. So things really went silent. Uh, and then things picked up in the 90s. There was a review by the Institute of Medicine in 1999 that talked about potential indications for cannabis and cannabinoids, and these include things such as uh, neuropathic pain, MS-related spasticity. Uh, and then uh, a couple years ago in 2017, the Institute of Medicine sort of updated that report and reviewed all of the literature and looked at systematic reviews since 2011, really just focusing on human studies because it's not always clear how much animal studies translate into human behavior and human outcomes. And this was their conclusions, that based on the evidence so far, there was substantial and conclusive evidence that cannabis or cannabinoids were beneficial in chronic pain, spasticity due to MS, and the control of nausea. There was moderate evidence that it might improve sleep in chronic medical conditions, limited disorders, uh, evidence in the anxiety disorders, and then no or insufficient evidence when it comes to things such as cancer, irritable bowel, irritable bowel syndrome, um, epilepsy, seizures, and so forth. Now, ep epilepsy is highlighted here, and I'll show you some data a little bit later as to why that's the case, but this is a rapidly evolving field. Um, but really, the most prestigious sort of review group in the United States found that cannabinoids really do have some medicinal benefits. So here's our image of, you know, when we think of people using pot, it's the young kids. As you probably know, sort of older adults are now the fastest growing population of people starting to use. They're still a minority of the users, but as a percentage, it's rapidly increasing. So then you may have the image of, this is the, the uh, pot smoker. But in fact, these are also people who are using cannabis right now, right? I'm just going to give a couple of results from a couple studies. Really, this, this presentation is really more broader than this. But these are some studies we did at the CMCR over the last decade or two. This was work done by Don Abrams at UC San Francisco, where he took HIV-positive patients who had neuropathic pain. He monitored them for a while, put them into a hospital, had them smoke cannabis, and then looked at the outcomes in terms of self-reported pain. And as you can see, once they started treatment, there was a significant drop in pain. There was an initial placebo effect, but then that uh, significant difference continued on for people who were getting active ingredient and showed a significant reduction in neuropathic pain uh, with 4% THC.
And partly we've done a number of studies with Barth Wilsey, who was at UC Davis, came down to UC San Diego, looking at neuropathic pain and what kind of dosing is needed. And this study demonstrates that you don't need high levels of THC to get the relief. So we had originally started off and did a study comparing 7% and 3.5% THC in, in a smoked cigarette. In this study we said, well, can we go lower because we were seeing sort of equal analgesic effects at 3.5% and 7%. And so for this study we looked at vaporized cannabis, 3.5% and 1.2% THC, so really small amounts. And as you can see here, both the 3% and the 1% were equally effective in terms of reducing neuropathic pain. As you can imagine, the people who got 1% had minimal cognitive effects. There were still some present, but they were minimal and obviously went away pretty quickly. And we did a post-analysis looking at, well, what's the relationship between being high, pain relief, and so forth? And as best we could in a fairly small sample, uh, it appeared that this was not just a matter of people getting high. There was a different sort of independent effect taking place for a reduction of pain. Another study coming out of our center was from Mark Wallace, who looked at experimental pain in healthy adults. In this case, he gave 15 adults different levels of cannabis, 2%, 4%, and 8%, uh, at a capsaicin uh, pain module, and then looked at pain relief 40 minutes later. And what you can see on the left hand, so on the left hand, or the y-axis, is the change from placebo, right? So. Going down is a reduction in pain, going up is an increase in pain. And then across the x-axis, you see the different levels of cannabis that were administered, low, medium, and high. And then he looked at different types of pain uh, in the different columns you see here. And what stood out in this was that if you gave just really low dose in this experimental model, there was not much pain relief. If you gave them the moderate dose, there was significant pain relief. But with the higher dose, they experienced more pain. So at least in this study, it showed that dosing really is important, and as with so many drugs, more isn't necessarily better. And in this case, it was sort of an inverted or a U-shaped effect. So you really have to monitor kind of what level and dosing people get. And there's been some evidence of this also in things such as anxiety, where if you give people high levels of THC, they may become more anxious rather than mellowed out. So this has nothing, this study has nothing to do with HIV, but it's a really important study because this was sort of a game changer. This is the study that GW Pharmaceuticals did looking at kids with intractable seizures. So they had 120 kids with Lex Gastaut syndrome. So these were kids who were having just constant seizures that were not improved with regular medications. They then gave them 20 milligrams per kilograms of CBD monitored them over a 14-week treatment period, and looked at the reduction in seizures. So on the left-hand side is the number of seizures these kids were having. Uh, you see the baseline in treatment. So as you can see, at baseline to treatment in the placebo group, in the yellow bar, there was no change. However, those who got CBD had a dramatic drop in the number of seizures over this time period. So ultimately, this and a few other studies led the FDA to actually approve Epidiolex as an FDA approved medication. It's actually from the cannabis plant. So GW has a farm in the UK where they grow cannabis plants in a greenhouse. And then it's a highly sort of purified form of CBD that comes out at the end. So it's still from plant material, but it's like 99% uh, percent plus pure CBD. Um, but it really was important because it was this first study that actually said that perhaps cannabis through careful review of the FDA could be usable as a treatment for different conditions. So we know when people smoke, they get high, right? So they have problems with learning and memory, uh, psychomotor slowing, problems paying attention and so forth. There are also studies showing that in constant and chronic users, and I think Dr. Chang will talk a little bit about this, there's probably some low to mid-level ongoing uh, impairment that is taking place. But there are also studies showing that if you have people stop, for the most part, after about 25 days of abstinence, they return to either baseline level or to the level of cognition that you would expect of people their age and education. So we know it has some impairing effects. They may or may not be transient. But since we know, and Dr. Chang's gonna talk about this, that, that THC and CBD may have anti-inflammatory uh, and neuroprotective effects, what happens when you give it to people 
who have an inflammatory condition. So at the HNRC, right, we've been following people for decades now. We're coming up on our 30th year as a center. Um, and Bob Keaton, Jen Udicello, and Scott Latender went back and did a retrospective uh, look at our participants, looked at their cognitive performance and their history of cannabis use. In this case, they had about, I think, 400 people that they put into groups of people who were naive or infrequent users. So they used maybe either not at all or used maybe once a month. People who were moderate users who used on average about 10 days a month and maybe smoked half a joint at that time. And then frequent users, these are sort of the really dedicated uh, cannabis users who are smoking daily and doing one to two joints a day. We then looked at cognition. Uh, if you're familiar with the HRC, we do a rather comprehensive battery looking at different uh, domains, seven different cognitive domains. And uh, you've probably heard of this, but we use something called the Global Deficit Score, which kind of takes the performance on all of these measures and puts them into a single um, data point that we can then analyze. In this case, in the GDS, a higher score means worse performance, worse cognition. So in this graph, you can see on the y-axis, we have the Global Deficit Score. Again, higher is worse in the three groups. And what this shows, in at least this observational study that, you know, obviously wasn't controlled and we had the best data that we could get uh, looking at cannabis over many years. We've become much more refined in the last few years. Uh, but at least in this early analysis, we see when we look at the GDS that the highest scores were in people who were non-users or frequent users, and people who used moderate levels of cannabis had better cognition than people who didn't use or use regularly. We also use a cut point because we're very interested in identifying people who are impaired or unimpaired in addition to sort of a continuous store, score. And we have many years of data showing that a cut point on this GDS of 0.5 is indicative of impairment. So if we cut people off at uh, 0.5 or higher on this GDS as being impaired, on the left-hand side you can see that about 50% of the infrequent users were impaired, similarly the case for frequent users, and uh, the lowest impairment rate, consistent with the GDS, was seen in the in moderate users. A different approach was taken by a grad student, Rowan Soliner at the HNRC, along with David Moore, and looked at superaging. So these are individuals who are 50 to 64 years of age. These are not people who are performing okay and in the, the, what you would expect for their level of performance. In fact, they're performing at T-scores that you would see of a younger individual of about 25 years of age. So they're really doing well on these tests. And they looked at, well, what are the predictors of who might be a superager uh, and living with HIV? So on the left-hand side uh, are the, the predictors the um, dots with the confidence intervals are showing likelihood ratio. And just so people interpret, we're not comparing these two values. This is actually showing for the probability of super aging versus be normal for your age. Here's the likelihood ratio and here's the value of one, meaning no significant difference. And yellow is probability of super aging versus being impaired for your age. So each one of these sort of stands on its own in terms of an analysis. And what you can see here is Rowan found that in terms of the negative predictors of being a superager on the left-hand side of the graph, things such as being older, having depression, or diabetes were actually predictive of worse performance. But people who are identified as superagers had a couple of features about them. One was they had a higher RAT score, that's a wide range achievement test. And this is a, a measure of pre-morbid intelligence, so they sort of came into the game with a, uh, better functioning. What stands out here is the a cannabis use disorder. So individuals who had a diagnosis, again, as best we could for, for that era of cannabis use disorder, were significantly more likely to be superagers compared to the cohort that was cognitively impaired. So again, at least a tease that perhaps uh, some use of cannabis may have some neuroprotective and anti-inflammatory factors. Again, these are observational studies. It's kind of first looks at these data, uh, but it is an intriguing concept. This research is not easy to do, particularly if you want to do uh, administration studies. So the studies I reported on, those last few were just observational studies. At the CMCR, we're doing a lot of 
uh, intervention studies where we give people cannabis, but there are a lot of barriers to this research and a lot of barriers to using cannabis as a medicine. One, of course, is, you know, uh, how do you give people sort of a, a joint to smoke and have them inhale carbon monoxide and so forth uh, if you're going to call it a medicine? Um, and in fact, when we had the early days of the CMCR back in the 2000s, when we got this bolus of money, we canvassed the state trying to get investigators interested in doing this. Uh, the people most interested were people working with HIV patients. We thought because of the Institute of Medicine report that, well, no-brainer would be cancer patients who are having pain and nausea. We could not find an oncologist in the state who was willing to have someone smoke uh, to get medicine. So, uh, but there are other options. So in this case, there's something called the volcano, and this is what we use for a lot of our research. And so this is an instrument that vaporizes plant material up to a level below combustion, you end up with sort of this fog and vapor in the balloon, and then the person inhales from the balloon. Donald Abrams at UC San Francisco did a comparison looking at smoked cannabis versus vaporized cannabis. And on the graphs at the bottom, you can see that the plasma THC levels were very similar whether you smoked or used this vaporized system. Uh, but the second graph over shows that the carbon monoxide was dramatically reduced if they vaporized. Obviously, vaping is a, a, a big deal, and so I just want to point out that this is not vaping. So vaping uh, and the things you hear about in the, the press are using oils to, to vape cannabis. This is vaporizing plant material, so there's no extra thing added to the plant material. So it has a lot of, none of the contaminants that you hear about uh, in the press these days. Another major barrier to us doing this research is DEA scheduling. So, as you're probably aware, the DEA schedules drugs into five classifications, one being the most restrictive, saying that there's absolutely no accepted medical use for this, and it is a high potential for abuse, and this goes all the way down to Schedule 5, when there's a low abuse risk and includes medications such as Robitussin. If we look at the scheduling of, of cannabis, you will see the insanity of our current system uh, and the inconsistencies. So in this case, if we look at THC, so the exact same molecule, if you get it from the plant, dating back to the 70s, uh, when against the advice of actually politicians and physicians, uh, it was made a Schedule I drug uh, for political reasons, if you get THC from the plant, it's Schedule I, it's, there's no medicinal value, it's highly addictive, etc. If you get that same molecule from a synthetic drug, such as dronabinol or marinol, it's a Schedule II, or Schedule III for marinol. And if you get that same drug only in liquid form in uh, Syndros, it's a Schedule II. So they're all THC, and it's all over the place. It's even more confusing if you look at CBD. So CBD, since it's a constituent in the plant, if you get it from the plant, and the way the DEA scheduling takes place is that anything from the plant is considered Schedule 1, that if it's from the plant, it's Schedule 1. If you get it synthetically, you want to do research from a company that's created CBD, it's also considered Schedule 1. Epidiolex was, again, a major event. The FDA looked at all the evidence and said, this is not a Schedule 1 drug, there's no uh, indication of abu abuse potential for CBD. Uh, there are sort of minimal side effects depending on the doses, etc. So they called it a Schedule 5. So CBD, it's actually from the plant, right? It's GW growing it in the UK, turning it into a, a medicine. Uh, it was called Schedule 5. Um, and then more recently, uh, you may have heard about the Farm Bill. Uh, this was legislation passed by Congress that says that if you get CBD from hemp and something that has less than 0.03% THC in it, then it's not scheduled at all. Now, I will say I've heard many presentations from the FDA, and even in terms of Epidiolex, they didn't feel it really needed to be scheduled at all. The only reason they scheduled it was because we have these international treaties that says anything from the cannabis plant needs to be on the schedule. Otherwise, they felt it should not even be a Schedule 5 drug. And that's what's sort of happening with hemp, is right now, at least according to the DEA, it's not scheduled at all. So you can buy it, etc. There are complications here, though, in that as soon as the DEA announced and, and this legislation was passed, uh, 
saying that it's no longer Schedule 1, the FDA said, wait, wait, wait. Okay. We're responsible for monitoring CBD and cannabis-derived medications or, or substances for health safety, and we have inadequate evidence in terms of using this in all the things that people want to use it in. So as of right now, even though CBD from hemp is not scheduled, we can't do any research with it because the FDA still sort of has a hold. And they're trying to figure out how to deal with this because it's complex, because they have drugs THC and CBD that are FDA approved medications and now how do you go about and call them sort of food supplements at the same time? So they're really in a conundrum. I think they're trying to deal with it. They had a, a hearing back in May, about 140 people presented. They had like 5,000 responses from the public. And so they're trying to sort this out uh, and it's a real challenge. And one of the challenges even in terms of you think of cannabis and cannabinoids as medicine, this GW has put about $500 million <laughs> into epidiolics, into other research, trying to turn these into medicines, follow FDA rules, clinical trials, et cetera. Uh, and if you can go ahead and buy CBD from your local CVS, uh, that may uh, kind of kill future research that takes place in terms of really rigorous uh, FDA approval processes. A third limitation on doing this research is really access to different constituents. So right now, the only place we can get cannabis is from the University of Mississippi. They've had a contract for decades from the federal government to grow cannabis uh, for, or for research purposes. And you know they've done the best they can. They're now getting higher levels of THC. They're now getting CBD-rich plants and so forth. Um, but it's, it's an inadequate supply. And so the DEA announced back in 2016, they go ahead and they'd open it up to more providers. They took applications, 33 of them, and then it just went into a black hole. It went into the Department of Justice and no one ever heard any response for years. Congress got really upset. They were writing nasty letters. There's a lot of legislation in there right now to give the DEA specific timelines like the FDA that they need to give feedback after 30 days. And so back in August of this year, the DA said, oh, we're going to reboot. <laughs> okay, we're going to do it again. Now we're going to you know, provide uh, an opportunity for more providers. Um, and we're going to re rewrite the rules and, and we're going to sort of take applications. Um, so we'll see what happens with that. One important aspect of this was that the DEA, again, sort of in this announcement said that, well, if you put an application early on and you were looking at CBD, and it wasn't more than 0.03% THC, so it's basically from hemp, you do not need to apply anymore, right? It's no longer a scheduled drug, so you can withdraw your application because you can go ahead and use that CBD. Of course, we still have the problems with the FDA, but that was just sort of a, a reinforcement from the EA that, in fact, this no longer is scheduled. And then the last barrier we have, among others, is access to real-world cannabis. So right now, I uh, don't know what it's like in New York, but in California, Colorado, et cetera, you can go out and buy ointments, tinctures, oils, et cetera. And some people swear by this, that for pain, CBD is really helpful for joint pain, et cetera. Um, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that these are useful, but we can't use them. We can't look at them at all. We can't touch them. So in San Diego, we can walk across the street, buy all of these products as a private citizen, but we are not allowed to touch them as researchers because they're still federally illegal, so we can't tell you about contaminants, whether or not they're effective, whether or not an ointment gets through the skin and actually penetrates into the system. Uh, we can't look at this at all. And it's important for many reasons, but this is just one example, that if you take THC and you smoke it, you get a different effect than if you take it as an edible. So if you smoke it, it immediately goes to your brain, you feel the high, and sort of by the time you finish your, you know, your last puff, you're starting to feel the effects, and within 10 minutes, you kind of know how you're doing. You can kind of titrate, hey, are you at the level of either pain relief or highness that you're looking for? Edibles, though, go through the body, go through first-pass metabolism, and it takes a couple of hours, or about an hour, to take effect. And what happens is THC gets transformed into 11-hydroxy, so it's really no longer the THC that's getting you high, it's actually 11-hydroxy. These two graphs show the difference between someone who smokes it on the left and taking it orally on the right, in this case, dronabinol. In the left-hand column, you can see that THC levels, which are on the y-axis, uh, in the green, 
go up extremely high within minutes of smoking, but then they drop dramatically, right? THC gets distributed to the brain, to the fat cells. So it's a real complication when you look at things such as impaired driving. You just cannot look at blood and relate that to impairment levels because it leaves the blood very quickly. The dash line at the very bottom of that left-hand uh, graph shows 11 hydroxy, and as you can see, it barely even blips. It doesn't make movement. On the right-hand side, though, you can see THC, when you take it orally, barely moves up. So the green line stays very close to the bottom. The middle line is the 11 hydroxy, and as you can see, it builds over the course of an hour or two and then extends over the course of many hours. So when people take edibles, they don't feel that effect until you know, 90 minutes or so after taking it, and then it can last anywhere from a few hours to up to eight hours. So it's a very different effect, both cognitively and perhaps medicinally when you take it orally. And I think there's evidence, so even when you take like CBD orally, there's like 6% bioavailability. So it's a, it's a very different mechanism than if you smoke it directly. I'm just going to end here talking about, uh, very briefly, pointing out sort of we've done a number of studies. We've completed these studies at the CMCR so far. So far. I've highlighted and read the studies that might have relevance to HIV and aging. Uh, so we've done a number of neuropathy studies. Uh, and then we have a lot of new studies that are starting up, either funded by NIH, private foundations, or these, these uh, state funding that we receive. Um, the top study there, we're doing a take-home study comparing dronabinol to smoked and vaporized cannabis over an eight-week period, trying to look at develop of tolerance and, and long-term relief. Uh, I'm doing a number of studies looking at impaired driving, and then we have other studies looking at things such as whether CBD can help wean people off of things such as Ambien uh, for insomnia. We have a preclinical model, look, model looking at uh, models of alcohol and nicotine dependence because there are indications that CBD may help sort of alleviate craving associated with going off some of these drugs. In terms of HIV and aging, so as you can imagine, there's just a lot of unknowns. So there are many factors that we need to consider if we're going to talk about cannabis or cannabinoids as a medication. You know, most of these studies, well, at least some of the studies have been done in healthy adults or we've done on people with just sort of specific conditions, maybe neuropathic pain. Um, however, as we all age, we're seeing a lot of difference uh, in our pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. We have reduced hepatic drug clearance and, and renal elimination, fat distribution changes, so knowing that THC is, is attracted to the fat, how does that change in older adults or people with HIV? Um, Polypharmacy is, is obviously very frequent. It's always sort of shocking when we do our studies at HNRC to see the number of medications that people are on. And we just don't know a lot about the interactions that take place if you're going to give people cannabinoids or cannabis. So for example, with Epidiablex, uh, clozapam was, um, uh, was dramatically increased in these kids uh, who were taking uh, it for, uh, for seizures. So there was a drug-drug interaction taking effect there, and I think there may be some indications that there's interaction with HIV medications. So we really need to know more about that. Obviously, there's cardiovascular risks when people acutely smoke. Uh, heart rate goes up, blood pressure goes down. There have been some studies showing some increased risk of cardiac events in, in when people smoke. I don't know that a lot is known about uh, either older adults or people with HIV. Uh, pulmonary risks. The Institute of Medicine they said there's no evidence of significant pulmonary risk in people smoking cannabis. This was in healthy adults. This was in the types of medication, or the, the THC levels that were used over the, uh, the previous decades. They're getting much higher now. I think there was a recent study that came out showing that actually in, in persons with HIV, though, there is an increased risk of pulmonary uh, problems and people are smoking. So again, we don't know much about in different vulnerable populations. Uh, and then, of course, cannabis use disorders. I don't know that it's a ter terribly addictive, but there are addictive features of cannabis, and so some people do develop, I think like 10 to 15 percent of cannabis use disorder, and it's not well known uh, how, more, how um, often people have previous use disorders might be prone to doing that. I think there's some estimates that perhaps uh, 20 to 30 percent of individuals uh, with HIV who have probably other um, disorders may be prone towards cannabis use disorder. So moving forward, so the potential anti-inflammatory and neuroprotective uh, 
effects of cannabis are really intriguing when we talk about inflammatory conditions. Uh, we really need research on a greater diversity of products. So right now, we get what we get from NIDA, but if you go out to the dispensaries, there are many different cultivars and chemovars. Uh, people call them strains. Uh, people in the business say strain is a bacteria. These are cultivars and chemovars. Um, so we really need to know what is the difference both in terms of different constituents, terpenoids, flavonoids. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities right now in terms of biosynthesis. Uh, a lot of companies are looking at how do you take minor cannabinoids, so these are things that are in small amounts in the plant, and really grow them so you can have large supplies available for medicinal research. And it raises the question of this entourage effect. So people have commented that you really need the whole flower. It's the combination of THC, CBD, and all these other cannabinoids and flavonoids that give it its medicinal benefits. That's yet to be shown and proven. So as people start looking at specific cannabinoids, we'll learn more whether or not, hey, you just need this certain uh, drug or these certain combinations. You don't need the whole plant, or maybe there are benefits. Uh, from having these things in combination. The lack of access to the real world cannabis is really limiting. So we just don't know, you know, uh, when you look at that state map of what people are using, we really cannot research any of that. So beyond vaping and the lung disorders that are happening, we don't know what happens when people do dabbing, when you take a big hit of THC immediately into your system, what are the effects there? Some people are doing studies to that effect. Um, there are indications that people self-titrate, and so people aren't getting completely stoned um, just because they're doing that uh, approach. And really, the long-term issue is that we need to look at long-term studies, right? All of our studies were uh, a couple days or a week. I'm doing a study looking at a couple months, but really we need to look at the long-term effects, both the benefits and the potential toxicities. This is our center. Igor Grant is, is our director, um, as well as many of the investigators. And it's my email address. I'm happy to uh, communicate with anyone who's interested. Thank you.